Good evening, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Mark Frankel. I'm director of the AAAS Scientific Responsibility Human Rights and Law Program, under the, whose auspices this series is held at AAAS. Uh, this is the third in our Neuroscience and Society series in 2015, and tonight's topic is mel mental illness through the ages, from children to adolescents to middle age and the elderly. And we have an excellent uh, series of speakers who have uh, uh, accepted our invitation to address us on the topic. Uh, before I go any further, uh, I'd like to introduce a relatively new staff addition uh, to AAAS, but by no means someone who's new uh, to the uh, community of people who are concerned about the, um, the role of science and technology in society. Uh, he's been with us less than a year, and I believe this is his first opportunity to attend one of our seminar, one of our series events. So please welcome uh, to AAAS our new Chief Executive Officer and former member of Congress, Dr. Rush Holt, who is in the back. Uh, Rush, we're delighted to have you here and uh, look forward to your joining us for other events in the series as the time, as your schedule permits. Um, this is a, a, a series, as some of you will know, is a partnership with the Dana Foundation. I want to acknowledge not only their financial support, but also their collaboration in planning these events. Uh, every year at the end of the series for that year, we get together and brainstorm about topics. And we end up with a list of, I don't know, maybe nine or 10, and, and without repeating, of course, topics from previous years. This, by the way, is the end of our fourth year. And uh, we brainstorm about, you know, what will be the topics, what's coming up, what's emerging, or what's just plain interesting, at least would be interesting to a public uh, audience. Uh, so I want to thank them uh, for all of the contributions that they make intellectually to the programs, um, as well as uh, financially. Uh, in planning for tonight's topic, I did a bit of background research uh, and was struck by some of the numbers associated with mental illness. Uh, in the United States. I have no doubt that our speakers will likely introduce others, but here are some that stood out for me. Nearly five million children in the United States have some type of serious mental illness, with an estimated $247 billion spent each year just on childhood mental disorders. Mental illness is linked to suicide, which is the second leading cause of death among adolescents between the ages of 12 and 17 years. And over 8% of adolescents suffer from depression that lasts a year or more. And that depression is the leading cause of disability in the United States in people over five years of age. Uh, as someone who does not work in this particular field, I found those numbers quite striking. Uh, and I think it goes without saying, and just looking at the numbers, forgetting, of course, for a moment, the, the personal price that people pay, just looking at the numbers suggests that we have a topic of great social importance uh, for all of us in the United States, and I suspect you can get similar numbers from other parts of the world um, as well. So now to our program, uh, after which we'll end around 7, and there will be a reception just outside the auditorium, and you're all invited to join us and the speakers and informally converse uh, about the topic of the day or whatever else interests you. Uh, you have speaker bios in your program. This is the program which I hope you picked up. So I'm not going to use a lot of time to go through all of these biographical materials. They're there for you to look at as you see fit, but I will um, uh, highlight a few things uh, in my introducing each individual speaker. There will be no questions after each talk. We'll save those for a period that will follow the third speaker when all of them will come up here. We'll have a moderated discussion or conversation, and then we'll open it up to people in the audience. You'll see mics on the aisles, microphones. This is being videoed and recorded. Uh, it will uh, be uh, um, posted on the uh, Dana Foundation website. Uh, typically, it's a week to 10 days afterwards. Uh, but we will also have a link to it from the AAAS uh, website. Uh, and then one final announcement that I forgot that I want to alert you to, and that's our final event in the series for 2015. It's going to be on October 27th here. Uh, 
and has a working title of Creativity and Genius. Creativity and Genius, and we're still fleshing things out a bit at this moment. Uh, but put that on your calendar and you'll hear from us uh, when, the, uh, when we're ready to go. So without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Nelson Freimer. Uh, Dr. Freimer is the Maggie G. Gilbert Professor in the Department of Psychology, uh, Psychiatry and Human Genetics in the David Geffen School of Medicine, Director of the Center of Neurobehavioral Genetics, Director of the Depression Grand Challenge, and Associate Director of the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior, all at UCLA. His research tends to focus on using the tools of large-scale genomic science to elucidate the genetic basis of common human disorders, but he's particularly interested uh, in a number of uh, those that fall under the rubric of mental illness. Uh, he is uh, going to focus on mental illness in the midlife and elderly time frame. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Feimer. Thank you for asking me to join this um, this session, and, and it's really um, a privilege to be involved in, in really such a valuable series. This is, is really an incredible thing that AAAS and Dana do. And so, as Mark said, I'm going to talk about mental illness in mid and late life, and um, this is a pretty heavy charge for 20 minutes of, of talk. And so what I'm going to try to do is very briefly sort of give a summary of what the illnesses that we're talking about are, a little bit about their prevalence and impact. He's already said a little bit about that. Um, and then I'll, I'll say something about treatment and the issues of treatment for these disorders in mid and late life. And then finally, um, I'll take the prerogative of just spending a couple of minutes talking about um, ge genetics and the role of research in really hopefully developing better treatments, which as you'll hear is something that we really need for these diseases. So, um, so what we're talking about when we talk about the main mental disorders of midlife and late life, the adult mental disorders, can really be broken down into these categories. Um, so disorders of thought, um, which by which we mainly mean schizophrenia, which consists of um, mainly psychotic symptoms like delusions, hallucinations, disorganization of speech and behavior, and the so-called negative symptoms, loss of volition, loss of affect, um, and so forth. Disorders of mood, by which we mean major depression and bipolar disorder, um, where both major depression and bipolar disorder are characterized by episodes of depression, which people are mostly familiar with, which involve depressed mood, loss of pleasure, alterations in sleep and weight, either up and down, slowed speech, loss of energy and concentration, feelings of worthlessness, and in its most extreme form, suicidality, which Mark also mentioned. Bipolar disorder um, also involves episodes of mania, which sim uh, you know, in simplistic terms are essentially the opposite of depression, elevated mood, pursuit of pleasurable activities, usually um, ones that are risky and can have <coughs> catastrophic consequences, with a decreased need for sleep, pressured speech, flight of ideas, and grandiosity, and both depression and bipolar disorder may have psychotic symptoms. Anxiety disorders, which may be the most common of all these disorders, for example, panic disorder, social phobia, some people would include post-traumatic stress in this category. I'm not going to um, uh, talk about it anymore in the interest of time. And then neurocognitive disorders, which again, some people may not consider mental disorders, but, um, but I think that they do go with the other disorders that we're talking about. And what really differentiates these disorders from the other ones we're talking about is that whereas the other ones are diagnosed and really recognized entirely on the basis of symptoms and subjective manifestations, the neurocognitive disorders such as Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, vascular dementia, are diseases for which we actually understand something about the underlying biology, we understand the pathology, which is different in all these types of disorders, and in many cases we actually have identified the genetic contributions to these diseases, which has really led to um, uh, the sort of the start of gaining traction on more specific uh, treatments. <clears throat> 
Uh, one thing I want to mention, though, is that all of these disorders are very prevalent. Um, schizophrenia, the least at 1%, but as you can see, with depression at about 7 to 10%, bipolar disorder, 3 to 4%, anxiety disorders as high as 20%, and these neurocognitive disorders as high as 5 to 6%. These are among the most common disorders that face our society. And as Mark mentioned, these disorders have an incredible impact on society. And so if one looks at the burden of disease, by which we usually mean the premature uh, loss of life or mortality and disability, mental disorders throughout the adult um, age ranges are the leading contributors um, to the burden of disease until the very, very last years of life when cancer and heart disease um, overtake it. But for most of this period of, of mid and late life, it's really the mental disorders that are the, the biggest impact diseases in society. And depression, as, as he also mentioned, is the leading one of all. Depression is the disease that is the leading contributor to global disease burden and even more so in North America. So it, this is really a very significant health problem. Um, however, the funding for this um, disease is, is really not commensurate with the burden that they represent. Now, I think that one should not just equate the amount of funding that a disease, um, uh, research in a disease gets with its um, burden of disease, I mean, clearly AIDS research has you know, been enormously important, um, not only for the United States, but for the world. But I do just want to really emphasize the fact that considering the burden that it represents, depression in particular, has been enormously underfunded at the federal level and, and also in terms of philanthropy. And it's, it's one of the reasons why we still understand so little about this disorder. And again, this is something that characterizes really all of these adult um, psychiatric disorders. And um, while we talk about all of these disorders as being um, adult uh, mental disorders, they all have different periods of the lifespan in which, they, um, in which they're particularly important. So this is actually a slide um, which shows the impact of disease, that is, the impact on the burden of disease of different disorders um, at different points in the lifetime. And I won't talk about um, the childhood and adolescent disorders that you'll hear about um, in the next talk. But to talk about the adult disorders, um, at the beginning of adulthood, um, disorders such as schizophrenia, drug and alcohol abuse play um, a particularly large role. And as you can see, um, in large part because of the excess mortality that affects people that um, that have these disorders. For example, people with schizophrenia have, it's estimated, something like a 10 to 15 year lower life expectancy than the rest of the population. And so by, adult li uh, by end of life, these disorders play a much smaller role. In contrast, depression, which is shown here, this, um, this light purple um, uh, horizontal bar, represents the largest um, uh, uh, prevalence and impact disorder really throughout the adult range. Um, bipolar disorder um, and anxiety disorders, again, are, are fairly um, constant throughout um, uh, the adult lifespan. It's important, though, to, to interpret these kinds of statistics cautiously, and I'm just going to give an example of this with respect to, to depression. So, um, so if one looks at, this is from what's called the National Comorbidity Study, a very large epidemiology study in the U.S., and um, if you look at this, you would think that, um, that prevalence um, follows this, um, this sort of very neat um, process where uh, it remains about the same prevalence and then is much less prevalent among the elderly. However, if one dissects this further, what you can actually see is that what really is determining this apparent decrease in prevalence among the elderly is really that depression is, is characterized by a cohort effect whereby each cohort, um, as a, each younger cohort, has a higher prevalence of depression at an earlier um, onset, so that those who are now in early adulthood um, will, by the time they are um, in late life, have a much higher prevalence of depression than the individuals who are now over 60. And so th this is something that's actually, again, a very important point, because it speaks to what will be an, a really an epidemic of depression in mid and late life over the next um, several decades. So to talk about treatment, um, the first point I want to make is that in some ways treatment has come an enormously long way over the past couple of hundred years. 
Um, this is a painting by Goya called The Madhouse from about 200 years ago, and it sort of conforms to what you might imagine was the treatment of severe mental illness in the Middle Ages where, where people who were suffering from these disorders were essentially thrown into what essentially amounted to prisons and not offered any treatment. Now, while we've gotten a lot better, it's, it's also really important to recognize the incredible deficit of treatment that we have for these disorders in our society. And this is something that particularly, I think, affects the United States. One very important point is that psychiatric inpatient treatment is almost completely disappearing. In fact, we have about the same number of psychiatric inpatient beds now that we had in 1850 when what you might consider the humane treatment of mental illness was just starting. And so, so that's really had the effect that mental illness is now seen primarily in places like the criminal justice system, where um, ranging from about 40% of the population of federal prisons to about 60% of the population of local jails are affected with major mental illness um, to the point where um, uh, not as a, as a facetious comment, it's stated that the Los Angeles County Jail is the largest psychiatric hospital in the world. Um, I've heard similar things said about the Cook County Jail, and, and I think it just speaks to, to the overall problem. And, um, and the other place where mental illness is, is found to an incredibly high degree is on the streets, where among the homeless, at least 30% of the population also suffers from uh, major mental illness. However, it's not just in these settings where, where treatment is really um, uh, insufficient. If you look at the population as a whole, less than 40% of all adults who have mental illness received any kind of treatment in the past year. And there's a major problem with um, ethnic disparities here, where, as you might expect, the, um, it's certainly not a great percentage of the white population who receives care for mental illness, but you can see that it's much greater than among Hispanic, black, and, and Asian populations. So really the major point about the treatment of adult mental illness is that it's just not being done. I mean, we can talk about the inadequacies of our treatments, which I will in a moment, but really the major point that I want to get out of this entire talk is that we really are doing very little to treat what is an enormous problem. And then we know that the failure to treat um, has really, uh, has really devastating effects, both for the society and for the individuals affected. And this is particularly true in mid and late life. So for example, taking depression, the failure to treat depression is associated with functional decline and increased disability throughout the mid and late life period. It's associated with increased use of regular health services, that is non-mental health services, and this has become an enormous economic issue. And it's also associated with increased mortality. Among individuals over the 15 months after being diagnosed with depression, there's a four times higher rate of mortality. And I'm just gonna mention briefly suicide and cardiac deaths. And so while teen suicide is something that obviously gets a lot of attention and, and, is, and is an obvious tragedy, the highest both rate and number of suicides are among individuals in midlife. Um, but what I think people may be really surprised by is that the rate remains incredibly high even among the elderly. So that, um, so that again, next to the group that's in, in the, the age range of 45 to 54, those over the age of 75 have the second highest rate of suicide of any age range. For cardiac disease, similarly, mortality um, uh, is an incredible consequence of depression. So this slide just shows over the months after myocardial infarction, the mortality rate among individuals who are not depressed compared to individuals who are depressed. And you don't really need any kind of statistics to see that this is really um, an incredibly powerful effect that depression has on death after myocardial infarction. So just to talk very briefly um, about the treatments that we have for these major disorders of adult life, and again, this is something that could be a, an hour-long discussion in its own right. Um, but the major categories of treatments include psychotherapy, um, uh, which includes both sort of a whole range of what might be called traditional psychotherapies. More recently has, has um, been particularly uh, what are called evidence-based therapies, such as cognitive and behavioral therapy. Um, drug therapy, including antipsychotic treatments, mood stabilizing treatments, which are primarily 
used in bipolar disorder and antidepressants, which are used in really all of the different categories of adult mental illness. Um, neuromodulation treatment is a category that's um, gotten uh, a lot of attention in the last few years. Um, in particular, for depression, the, the sort of initiation of, of methods such as transcranial magnetic stimulation or even deep brain stimulation, the, which involves implantation of um, uh, electrodes uh, to, uh, to stimulate particular areas of the brain. But I also want to really emphasize that the, the sort of the oldest of all of these forms of treatment in some ways is electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, which of all the treatments for depression is actually the most um, uh, uh, effective and as actually um, because of that fact is increasingly being used. But really all of our current treatments are unsatisfactory and, and that's what's going to drive uh, my talk about research in the last few minutes. So for example, antipsychotic drugs have really serious side effects. For schizophrenia, they mostly target the so-called positive symptoms like hallucinations and delusions. They really don't at all target the negative symptoms, which are really the ones that may be most disabling, which really are the ones that prevent people from, say, going to school or going to work. Um, we really have no treatments for bipolar depression that are, are very effective, and, um, and this is really the, the major source of disability for bipolar disorder is our inability to treat the depressive phase. We're actually pretty good at, at treating, preventing the manic phase with mood stabilizing drugs. <laughs> and depression treatments are really incredibly unsatisfactory. They take too long to work. They usually take months to begin to show an effect. They're very, very modestly effective. Perhaps 50% of the people who are treated with either psychotherapy or drugs get only, at best, a very partial effect. And they're completely nonspecific, although depression is probably a very heterogeneous disorder. When we go to treat depression, it's like throwing a dart at a dartboard blindfolded. We really have absolutely no targeting at this point. And then I just want to mention that there are special issues in the treatment of mental illness in late life. Um, neurocognitive disorders, we essentially have no treatments which really do anything to slow, um, much less stop the decline in cognition from these disorders. Um, the treatments that we use for other disorders may in fact worsen cognition, so drugs that we use to treat, say, psychosis or depression. Um, and because of the fact that people are in the elderly having um, a lot of other medical problems, there's an increased problem of side effects and drug-drug interactions. So again, throughout the entire range of these disorders, we have um, really no good treatments at this point um, that we should feel um, very satisfied with. And so the last point that I want to make is that to improve treatments, we must understand causation. And our current diagnostic system in psychiatry, in particular that that um, uh, describes these adult, these adult disorders, is based on observation and self-report. As I mentioned, the neurocognitive disorders are based on pathology, or at this point, even based on molecular understanding. Um, but for disorders like depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, they really all um, are still diagnosed according to the system developed by Emil Kraepelin, who was a German psychiatrist at the turn of the last century. Um, based on his observations, he sort of, because people stayed in, in mental hospitals at that time for years, he was able to make observations over years in, in most of his patients. And on the basis of course of illness, he separated the mood disorders, depression and bipolar disorder, from thought disorders like schizophrenia. He, he really made these categorizations based on the observation that people with schizophrenia had a, what he considered a, a chronic and unrelenting course, whereas these disorders had an episodic course. Um, but of course, this doesn't really conform to, the, to um, the complete clinical reality. And so if one actually looks at these disorders, which he treated as completely separate, one can see that at the level of the clinical manifestations, if not the disease course, that is the clinical manifestations that are the targets for treatment, things like hallucinations, like suicidality, like delusions, that there's an incredible overlap between these disorders. And one can see this when one looks at the results of genetic studies. Recent studies have really emphasized this overlap has a genetic basis. So for example, if we look at the whole range of studies that have been undertaken 
comparing bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, uh, depression, schizophrenia, depression, bipolar disorder, one can see that these disorders at the genetic level are, are really quite correlated with each other. That is, to really get to the causation um, involves trying to study them together. And, and it's really the only way that we're going to get to new treatments, in my opinion. And so um, now in, in the last couple slides, this slide actually um, uh, sort of summarizes really the, the history of genetic research for these disorders. And um, without going through it in detail, um, you know, this takes the whole range of the psychiatric disorders, um, and we've already talked about how highly prevalent they are. They all have a very strong genetic basis. They all have a very high degree of heritability in families. Um, we are now just beginning to get success from doing genetic studies. Um, and so studies looking at common genetic variation. Um, we now have, for example, for schizophrenia, over 110 different genes that are now conclusively associated with schizophrenia, which is, in my mind, a truly remarkable accomplishment. However, the results have been much less good for some of the other disorders, and I'll particularly mention depression, which, as I have been emphasizing, is the, the most prevalent and um, uh, the one that has the largest impact, where we've really, at this point, had almost um, uh, no success from genetic studies. And, and that's really because in order to hallucinate the genetic contribution to a disease like depression, which is so heterogeneous and complex, is going to take very, very large studies. And so this is a, a quote from Steve Hyman, who's a former director of the National Institute of Mental Health, which is saying that to understand the molecular mechanisms of depression, we're going to need to collect data from more than 100,000 people. And so the last thing that I want to talk about is, is actually the, the endeavor that I'm most involved with, which is called the Depression Grand Challenge. And, um, and has the goal of ultimately eliminating the burden of depression, but, um, but sort of taking Steve Hyman's uh, challenge at its word, we're now embarked on a study of 100,000 people with depression to try to identify the genetic contributions to depression risk, which will lead to new molecular targets for treatment, to identify markers for depression course and treatment response, so that unlike throwing a dart at a dartboard blindfolded, we'll have more specific treatment, and this really is what people nowadays are calling precision medicine and has gotten a lot of publicity recently. And ultimately, from the results of these studies, we will hopefully be able to implement new treatments and preventive interventions. And this is something that I'm mentioning here for depression, but really it's the same process that we hope will occur for all of these disorders. Thank you. I told you there'd be other numbers. Um, they're all very discouraging, unfortunately. Uh, so our next uh, speaker, thank you, Dr. Freiman. Our next speaker is Dr. Anne-Marie Albano. Uh, she is a professor of clinical psychology and psychiatry at Columbia University Medical Center and founder and director of the Columbia University Clinic for Anxiety and Related Disorders. She's board certified in clinical child and adolescent psychology and is the inaugural editor of Evidence-Based Practice in Child and Adolescent Mental Health. Evidence-based practice is, uh, is a phrase that really resonates here at AAAS. Um, so I'm delighted she's able to join us, and as you might imagine, she's going to be discussing mental illness uh, among children and adolescents. So please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, my turn to mess up here. Ah. Um, in this talk, what I want to go over today is a bit of discussion of the rates of mental illnesses in kids, children, and adolescents. You saw a little bit of it in the previous talk, but we'll talk more in depth. What we know about treatment, what we know about treatment based on the science, but what we know also about what's going on in the community. And I want to focus on two neglected age groups, the very young children and those who are emerging into adulthood, and then what we're going to be looking at going forward. So first, let's just take a quick look at the scope of the problem. This is a slide from the study of the National Com Comorbidity Survey of Adolescents conducted by Kathleen Marikangas, in addition to Ron Kessler and others. And what I want you to focus on here is bearing in mind when do these disorders start and what are these disorders that wreak havoc in the lives of children. What you see is Starting at age four, so here's age and years, and this is cumulative percent in terms of prevalence, 
Starting at age four, you see the onset of anxiety disorders. These continue a steep and steady rise throughout adolescence, through age 18, and as we saw previously, throughout the lifespan. Anxiety disorders in childhood predict every mental illness you can name in adulthood. In the old days, parents would be told about their child's fear of the dark, fear of separating, don't worry, they'll grow out of it. It's a phase. What this data and others have shown is they are not phases. In fact, anxiety disorders are the gateway disorders for every mental health condition that comes next. All right, so we have to keep that in mind. These are not benign conditions. Next, the age of onset around six to seven years of age, eight, are the disruptive behavior disorders. We're talking here about ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder. And then when we hit the adolescent years, you're looking at conduct disorder, what might be precursors to then antisocial personality. So these are the next disorders of onset. You see here then adolescent depression. Depression sometimes will occur earlier in childhood, but mostly girls 13 to 14 years of age are at higher risk. And then for boys, it's a little later, uh, 15 to 16 years of age. But depression is typically preceded by anxiety, so we remember that. And then finally, the last disorders of onset per se are the substance use conditions, right? So 16, 17 years of age, a lot of times use of substances is in response to self-medication of anxiety or depression or in reaction to acting out that you get from the externalizing disorders. So these disorders add to one another and it's very rare in any of our studies that we have conducted um, to find only one or two conditions in a youth of any given age. They are usually multiply comor comorbid with three, four, five or more conditions in one child. Just so we also look at this, these are rates for now autism spectrum diagnosis and you could see from 2000 going to 2010, what we look at is an increased prevalence but actually this may be more of a better characterization and classification of youth who have the spectrum uh, or on the spectrum in one way. Uh, if I talk to colleagues like Kathy Lord, who's an expert in this area, uh, she will say that we are really categorizing kids more and whether there are kids who are false positives here, you know, it depends. There's a wide range of variation in who gets diagnosed with these disorders. Um, but the bottom line is, is that children are suffering, they're suffering early, and they're suffering from all the conditions that you heard talked about in adults. They're just coming on earlier at time. So what do we do about this? Because one of the things we know is for any given mental health problem, it interferes with the child's functioning. It interferes with their ability to progress in school. It interferes with their ability to make and keep friends and become socially adept. It interferes with family functioning and then the vegetative aspects of it. They don't know how to soothe themselves. They get into great distress. There's a lot of somatization and such. So kids are really suffering in a big way. Now the good news is that we do have effective treatments. And just to give some examples of some of the key studies in child and adolescent mental health funded by the National Institutes of Mental Health, one is the Child Anxiety Multimodal Study uh, where we had 488 children between the ages of seven to 17 randomly assigned to combination treatment of cognitive behavioral therapy or SSRI of sertraline, cognitive behavioral therapy alone, sertraline or pill placebo. And the good news from the acute outcomes are that three different treatments are effective for the anxiety disorders. This is separation, social, and generalized anxiety disorder. What you find is the combination treatment is the most effective, significantly better than all others, but the two monotherapies are just as effective as one another and they too are significantly better than pill placebo. Effective treatments, let's keep that in mind. The outcomes for this hold out over six months in terms of keeping the children after we broke the blind. Uh, we kept the kids who were responders on maintenance therapy and they continued to hold their outcomes over six more months. If you look at the other large trials that were conducted, the multimodal treatment of ADHD study. This was the largest study ever funded for the treatment of youth. Again, I think they were closer to seven to 14 years of age with ADHD. Here, what we find is methylphenidate, 
or the um, uh, stimulant medication is equally effective by itself to combination of methylphenidate with behavioral interventions. And the behavioral interventions involve classroom training, parent training, uh, and some self-control training for the youth. But by itself, behavioral interventions were not significantly different from just whatever you can get in the community that wasn't an evidence-based treatment. However, over the longer, longer terms, the behavioral interventions caught up with the kids who were treated with combination or methylphenidate. It just might be that for these behavioral treatments, they take a little longer. In the Treatments for Adolescents with Depression study, of which I was a, a principal investigator there too, combination therapy for adolescents between the ages of 12 and 17 is the most effective treatment. And there what we saw is cognitive behavioral therapy with Prozac. And in fact also when you have the combination, you have fewer incidents of uh, suicidality or self-harm, okay? But then fluoxy fluoxetine or Prozac by itself was effective and better than CBT, which did not separate from placebo after 12 weeks. But again, if you go out to 16 weeks, CBT is doing well. And we likewise know that interpersonal therapy also, again, doesn't come on as quickly in terms of the effects as the medication, but then also is an effective therapy evidence-based for, for uh, adolescent depression. And then finally, the pediatric OCD treatment study, combination treatment, was superior to all the others, but, but CBT was superior to the medication only, and the medication actually um, was just beating placebo here. The bottom line, what we know is we do have effective treatments in pharmacotherapy and also in evidence-based cognitive behavioral and behavioral interventions and interpersonal therapy. Um, this is just a follow-up of the TAD study, the Treatments for Adolescent Depression study, and again, you find this where the psychosocial intervention by itself tends to pick up, up over time when, uh, in comparison to the medication conditions. But with that in mind, what's happening in the community? What actually are our kids getting when they seek care in the community from providers? Well, one thing to know again, this is from the National Comorbidity Survey, the community prevalence of any disorder that you see here is not at all being touched by the prevalence of treatment for that disorder in the community. So where we have an 11.7% prevalence of mood disorder, you're only seeing about 4.6% of those kids receiving treatment. And if you look at disorders with high levels of prevalence, specific phobia, which are not, as I said, benign conditions, 1.4% are receiving treatment. Social phobia, which is one of the most prevalent anxiety disorders in adulthood, uh, that is just gonna stick with these kids, again, 1.4%. So we're pretty bad at getting kids into treatment at a time when they most need it. I want you to also bear in mind something. When children develop a mental illness, as you saw in the first slide, it starts early. This, as soon as they develop a mental illness, they become very different from their peers. They are taken off the developmental trajectory of just normal development. They are not socializing the way the other kids are. They are not accessing and learning uh, from their teachers and in the environment of school the way others are. They are more disrupted in terms of their mood and regulating their emotions than others. They're not learning social problem solving skills. They're not becoming independent. And for whatever reason, maybe because they're suffering, maybe because the parents are anxious about how behind they are, this is where what the lay people call helicopter parenting we call parental overprotection occurs, parents swoop in to help. What happens is kids fall behind developmentally and they don't learn to struggle and deal with things and the skills that the other kids have, so they chronically fall behind others. So what we need to do is deliver effective interventions, but here's something to for us to think about. Where is the gap between having developed effective interventions in studies and transporting them and delivering them into the community. Well, one of the things that we know is that what we call a research to practice gap for any kind of intervention is 
whether the intervention is provided or not provided based on evidence. And there's different types of evidence. We could have evidence of a positive effect, like you see for some of the slides I showed for depression, anxiety, and so forth. If that treatment from the TAD study, the MTA, any of them, if they're delivered in the community, there's no practice gap, things are fine. But if a child, let's say, is referred for an anxiety disorder and they are not given one of the evidence-based interventions, they may be sent to playing solitaire therapy or something, that is a failure to translate the evidence. And that child then doesn't get help with getting back on track of managing the emotions and then also developmentally on track. But we also know about treatments in the community that actually have evidence of a harmful effect. When that intervention is provided, that causes harm, okay? So that's a gap that can be harmful. There may be evidence of no effect. That is, there's no evidence that this treatment works. It's kind of like giving out placebos. This is opportunity costs. When kids and parents spend time and resources in a therapy that's going nowhere and the child is not referred to an evidence-based treatment. And then finally, we just have some treatments that do not have studies behind them yet, but they're out there. And we could talk about traditional psychotherapies where we need to study these interventions and understand what's happening. So just to understand what is delivered in the, treat in the community, many kids get sent for disruptive behavior disorders to boot camp type settings. There is, in fact, evidence that these programs do harm. So kids should not be sent there. They actually should be sent to more of the um, fast track or um, uh, multi-systemic therapy or dialectical behavioral therapy approaches which have evidence behind them. We also know dolphin and equine therapy. It's equine therapy in the north. It's dolphin therapy in Florida. Lots of kids with disruptive behavior disorders, anxiety, depression, you name it. There are absolutely, there's no evidence thus far that these treatments work. And so what happens, and these are costly treatments for families, opportunity is lost because again, the child is in a program that's not changing their mental illness issue, not putting back them back developmentally where they need to be. The families are sinking money, they're losing hope, and the child is losing time. Let's remember, you only have 18 years, roughly, until you are supposedly out in the world. And some of the more severe problems that we've seen, these rage reduction holding therapies, where you wrap a child in a blanket or various ways, children have actually died from this. Again, it does harm. And then we've heard a lot in the news recently about conversion or reparative therapies for sexual orientation. Again, these do harm. Thank goodness this is where we see kids committing suicide. And these are prominent in the news in a number of cases because of families trying to get them converted to being straight. These, thank goodness, these therapies are being outlawed in certain states. So again, there's different problems with the translation of the evidence base to the community and that is also being served by the fact that in training programs for mental health practitioners, psychiatry, psychology, PsyDs, and uh, masters of social work, for example, we really don't train and compel the programs to offer evidence-based treatments. Psychiatry has come online, they're doing a better job, but even in my beloved psychology, we are not compelling training programs, we're not making accreditation based on whether they train in evidence-based treatments. They offer some courses, but they don't require them, and they don't require competency. So the other thing to bear in mind is, like I said, besides the fact that all kids suffer, what we also know is that in the community, if you are between the ages of three and seven, and you have a mental health disorder, you are now more likely to be prescribed an antipsychotic than not. And this data comes from a wonderful researcher by the name of Mark Olfson, who I happen to be married to, and his colleagues. And the, the sad thing that's illustrated here, first of all, especially if you're a boy between the ages of two or three, but also girls, 
You are not, in these data, these kids did not have a mental health visit in the year prior to getting prescribed this medication. And there's no evidence, randomized controlled trials for anxiety, ADHD, and other uh, di diagnoses, um, except in the area of autism spectrum. So we have to do something because, in fact, there are evidence-based parenting programs, parent-child interaction therapy and others, that are highly affected for turning around kids in this age group. We also need to look at our emerging adults, what Jeffrey Arnett, the developmentalist, calls the age of in-between. The problem with our emerging adults, 18 to 29, is there are no services specializing in the transition. Child and adolescent psychiatrists say goodbye. Adult psychiatrists say, eh, come around when you're 30, 35. These kids, though, are struggling. There's no coordination between services for them and a very low rate of referrals amongst this age group. So again, with this cohort, and this is from the National Comorbidity Survey, you see high rates of disorder in terms of prevalence and lifetime um, for the various conditions of anxiety, and I'm just picking a at anxiety, but mood disorders and others too. But then when you look at who's getting care, this is a slide that shows in children 13 to 18, and then after age 18, use of services drops significantly when you hit the young adulthood or emerging adulthood years, okay? So conditional service use means that they used any services in the three months prior to the uh, occasion of a mental condition. When they're under their parents' roof, they're getting it, but as soon as they can say no, this doesn't mean they get out from under the parents. They stay home, but they're refusing services because they can. So from a public health perspective, and I'm gonna hand this over in a second here on that, but just bear in mind in the state of working with children and adolescents, there are concerns that we have because we have high prevalence of these diagnoses that take kids off their developmental trajectory, which double whammies them. These conditions build upon one another. Anxiety leads to depression, to substance abuse, and so forth. And what happens is, although we have effective treatments, many children do not receive them. And when they are receiving treatments in the community, they may not be evidence-based treatments. In fact, they may be treatments that can do much harm. So we need to find ways of beefing up and really um, disseminating effective treatments but engaging kids and their families. Uh, one of the things that we have to do, too, is given that we have effective treatments, we still have to answer the main question that parents come into centers like mine with, what do we start with for my kid? How long do they have to be in that therapy? And what's gonna happen when it stops? Now, I'm of the opinion, having worked for many years with children and adolescents, that kids should be kids. They shouldn't be on somebody's couch or in my empty chair for the time of their development. They should be in when they need it, but they need skills and evidence-based treatments so they could get back into their world. What we need to do then is continue to develop our treatments and make use of what we're learning in neuroscience, in genetics, and in also uh, in other areas of medicine and psychiatry where we can target various risk factors and various mechanisms. Um, so there's a lot that needs to go on to look at what happens within families, what kind of risk factors such as behavioral inhibition and others that put kids at risk for certain disorders and see how to tailor treatments to meet these needs. We need to disseminate our effective treatments for youth who are early in development, such as parent management training, and address something that is not often studied when we study child treatments, and that is what about the parents. And just late breaking news uh, in the last week is Golda Ginsburg, uh, from the University of Connecticut, formerly from Hopkins, just uh, published the results of her study that looked at group of, of families that were randomly assigned to just getting psychoeducation information and being monitored. These are families who had children with anxiety disorders versus families who were randomly assigned to receive for the parents a program that addressed their anxiety and the way that they parented their anxious child. And what was found in this study then is that the kids who got the coping program, the families with the coping program, 
were delayed and had much less occurrence of a new anxiety disorder, whereas those kids whose parents had problems themselves uh, and were assigned to the education program, they did develop anxiety disorders. So what we have to do is focus on the parents in a way that we haven't before. In addition, we have to increase access to care, and I think a big thing is changing the standards by which programs operate for training clinicians and states operate for licensing clinicians. Um, that's something that has to happen. And then also require our, our clinicians to deliver evidence-based treatments. And I think the Affordable Care Act is helping with that in many ways because it is much more outcomes-based. Um, just so we take a look here, in terms of young adults who now have health insurance, they are now seeking treatment for mental health care and are making use of uh, being on their insurance policies of their parents much longer, which will hopefully keep them engaged in treatment so that they can get access to care over the longer term and not just tune out once they turn 18. So I'll just summarize. These disorders start early in childhood. They run a chronic course. They build upon one another. We have effective treatments, but they're not readily accessible. Um, and even though they are there, uh, in a lot of places, kids don't often receive care, and it's critical for us to understand how to address what kids need for how long, and then also how to deal with taking them off treatments when the time comes. Okay, I will leave it at that. Thank you, Dr. Habano. Well, we've sort of looked at the spectrum, if you will, along age categories. Uh, now our final speaker is going to sort of look at a, a bigger, bigger picture, sort of the social and policy perspective, and she is Dr. Colleen Barry, who is Associate Professor and Associate Chair for Research and Practice in the Department of Health Policy and Management at Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health. Her research is focused on the impact of policies on such things as to broaden access to mental health and substance use disorder treatment through insurance expansions. Uh, other issues, equalizing insurance coverage for those services comparable to other medical benefits, and alter financing to improve integration of behavioral and medical care. I think to a certain extent, we're gonna hear about the access issue uh, in this presentation that uh, we heard about uh, from our previous speakers, uh, that even if there is treatment out there, uh, a lot of the people who need it are not getting it. There are probably a lot of reasons, from the personal to the societal for that, and uh, I expect that we're going to hear about some of those uh, from Dr. Barry. So please join me in welcoming her to make her presentation. Thank you to the AAAS and to the Dana Foundation for inviting me to be here to speak today. I'm going to orient uh, my talk in the following way. I'm going to first um, build on my colleagues' presentations by uh, thinking about the population with mental illness, in particular in the context of how healthcare services are delivered and, importantly, how they're financed. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about some uh, major uh, federal policy changes over the last few years that have aimed to address uh, the treatment gap and the evidence-based care and quality gap that we've heard about. And I'm going to um, end by putting these issues in the context of um, what we know, since part of the focus of um, this session is on society, what we know about society's attitudes toward mental illness um, and uh, the issue of stigma. Um, so uh, to begin, I'm going to skip over this slide because I think we've made the case so far that these uh, conditions are highly prevalent and they can be extremely debilitating uh, for individuals with more severe disorders. Um, here, um, in the U.S., we spend about uh, $172 billion, or about 7.4% of total health care spending on mental illness and substance abuse, uh, and most of this is related to mental illness, about 6.3% of total health care spending dollars. Um, and it's important to note that the um, share of total health, 
uh, total health care spending that's going to mental health has actually been decreasing over time, and this is in large part because of the rapid increase in the denominator, the total health care spending dollar over the last few years. Um, if you, and, and you saw this in a somewhat different form um, in the prior presentations, but if you look more closely at how the money is spent, you see that about 14 and a half percent of all adults, uh, 18 or older here, I'm focused on adults, receive some mental health treatment during uh, the year, but not all of those with a diagnosable mental illness receive services. In fact, only about 41 percent uh, receive some type of treatment. And the likelihood of receiving treatment is associated with the severity of your condition. Uh, about 63 percent of those with a serious mental illness receive treatment in a year, about half with a moderate mental illness, and um, about 30 percent with a mild mental illness. And here I'll also note, um, interestingly, that about 8.5 percent of those with no diagnosable illness receive treatment as well. And this could represent a variety of things, including people um, with no need for treatment getting treatment, but also individuals who have been well maintained on treatment and are thus uh, asymptomatic. Here, and I think that Venn diagrams are popular in this panel today, but this version of the Venn diagram is trying to illustrate this issue where you can see the larger circle shows the number of people with a diagnosis of mental illness. The second circle depicts those who receive treatment. Clearly, some with a diagnosis don't receive treatment, and some receive treatment that don't have a formal diagnosis. The third circle depicts individuals with serious impairment. And again, some of this group falls outside the treatment system. Um, and some may have an impairment maybe because of loss of a, a family member, um, but don't meet diagnostic criteria. And the largest portion of mental health spending is clearly devoted to the intersection of these three circles, those with a diagnosis, receiving treatment, and with high levels of impairment. Um, but it, it's important to note that the U.S. healthcare system always, doesn't always um, do a good job of matching mental health services to those with the greatest need. Here, and this point was already made, so I'm not going to dwell on it, we've seen a huge decline um, in the number of beds available in the U.S. for psychiatric treatment, um, paralleling this shift away from inpatient care. And we've heard a lot, I think, in the news and elsewhere about overcrowding in emergency rooms due to psychiatric patients and what hospitals report as um, emergency department boarding of patients with psychiatric illness. And this is supported by a recent survey of state mental health authorities that found that the majority of states, the great majority of states, reported substantial shortages in psychiatric beds. If you break down um, the spending on mental health services um, financed by uh, government versus by private sector um, for mental health compared to the overall health care system, you can see they look um, somewhat different. We spend more public dollars on the mental health um, sector, about 60 percent of total mental health spending compared to only about 50 percent when you look at the overall health sector. Um, and this difference reflects uh, a long history here of government involvement in financing of care for individuals with mental illness. Um, here, this shows the distribution of spending on mental health treatment by payer, and you can see that Medicaid, this is the program for low-income uh, individuals in the country, and the private health insurance system are um, shouldering the bulk um, of this um, distribution of spending, each about a quarter. But I want to draw your attention to the 11 percent out of um, pocket. This is individuals paying out of their own pockets for services for themselves or their families. And I want to emphasize the point here that this is um, a, a major, this represents a major shift. Financial pr protection from the costs of mental health treatments has improved dramatically over the last 50 years. Um, and this, I'm going to just take a quick departure to tell a story about um, uh, Senator Paul Wellstone, um, who many of you uh, may remember, who prior to his death had been very involved in advocacy issues um, and legislation in mental health. And he described his motivation for being involved in this issue um, as uh, due to his experience, um, the experience of his brother, who during his college years had a, a breakdown, and it was, uh, we called it a breakdown, um, and um, left college 
um, and was hospitalized for a period. Uh, Paul Wellstone's brother returned to college. He did well. He graduated. But it took um, his working class parents uh, over 20 years to pay off the accumulated medical expenses. So I don't want to, um, um, I would be remiss by not um, noting what a difference um, has occurred over uh, this time period in the out of pocket burden, not to say that it has gone away. Here I show um, how mental health spending is divided across different types of treatments. And this also illustrates a shift um, over the uh, past several decades. The share of spending dedicated to inpatient care has dropped dramatically um, and has um, we've seen a substitution toward outpatient treatment and psycho uh, psychotropic um, medication use as evidenced in the prior talks. Um, the share devoted, the share of mental health spending devoted to prescription drugs has, has tripled over this time period. You can see from 8% uh, to 28%. Um, you can also see that that share is flattening. Since the beginning of 2002 and continuing um, into the present, many of the most commonly used um, medications to treat depression, to treat um, psychosis, um, have lost patent protection, and these costs, the costs of these drugs have really decreased as a result, um, and the share of spending dedicated to drugs has lowered, is flattened and lowered as a result, and will continue over the next few years. Um, here, uh, I, I want to sort of make an even stronger point related to the reliance on uh, psychotropic medications. Um, while on this slide, you can really see this by looking at the combination of the, the light blue piece of the pie, um, the red pie, and the green pie. Um, you can see that together, um, 81% of all individuals receiving mental health treatment receive psychiatric medication. So this is a large share of the treatment we are currently providing. And it's worth emphasizing that blue slice that shows that almost half of all individuals who receive any treatment are receiving only a medication. Um, while the second uh, generation medications are generally somewhat easier to dose and prescribe, uh, making it easier for primary care physicians to get involved in the treatment of um, mental health conditions, we see from this graph that the vast majority of spending on mental health treatment, uh, almost three quarters, um, is still being spent in the mental health specialty sector. However, access to specialty providers um, is a real problem, um, in particular within certain specialties, child psychiatry, for example, and within certain areas, in particular rural areas, where it's really hard um, often to get access. Um, in a recent study, about two-thirds of primary care physicians reported that they couldn't get an outpatient uh, m mental health specialty uh, referral for their patients. This is a much higher rate um, than for other specialties. Um, another issue that's linked to this is uh, and that creates barriers to access is that many psychiatrists don't participate in, private, in either private or public insurance. Psychiatrists are much less likely than other types of specialty physician groups to participate with only 55% accepting private insurance, 55% accepting Medicaid, um, and even less, about 45%, I'm sorry, 55% accepting M Medicare, and um, only about 45% accepting Medicaid. Um, with, with that, I want to just in my limited time switch quickly um, to um, overview uh, two of the major policy changes that have occurred in the last few years that have aimed at both the access issue and some of the delivery system challenges um, and financing challenges that I've talked about. Um, and that uh, those policies are the federal um, mental health and addiction parity law uh, that was passed by Congress in 2008 and the Affordable Care Act. And first, I'm going to just begin with parity. Um, historically, <clears throat> private health insurance has been much more limited for mental health uh, and for substance abuse than for general medical care. 
Um, and here I show you a benefit comparison for what I would call a typical private employer sponsored plan circa 2007 or 2008. You can see that mental health benefits include certain annual limits on the number of inpatient days and outpatient visits that aren't paralleled on the, me on the m medical side, um, as well as uh, higher levels of co-insurance. Often we saw higher co-pays as well. Um, and mental health advocates viewed these uh, limits the, the differential insurance coverage as evidence of discrimination uh, and worked for years to achieve um, so-called parity, meaning equity in insurance coverage. Um, and we're able after about 15 years to pass um, the uh, Paul Wellstone and uh, Pete Domenici Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act in 2008. It was implemented in 2010. It was extended in some pretty important ways in 2004 14. Um, the law applies uh, to both employer-sponsored plans with 50 or more employees um, under the Affordable Care Act. It's extended into the individual and small group market as well, um, as well as um, some government programs. It prohibits these special types of treatment limits. It requires equity and financial requirements. And it also requires equity in what's called in this sort of techie, nerdy way, non-financial treatment limits, which basically means um, prior authorization, utilization review, the adequacy of provider networks, all of these on the mental health and addiction side need to, by law, be equivalent to what's um, provided on the general medical surgical side. Um, quickly, um, there are a lot of pieces of this um, large um, law, the Affordable Care Act, that have potential implications for uh, individuals with mental illness. Um, first, it enacted a series of insurance market reforms, for example, prohibiting um, health plans from using pre existing condition exclusions or charging much higher premiums based on an individual's health status, clearly relevant to the population of individuals um, with health insurance. Second, and perhaps most importantly, in the states that have now counting 31, uh, including the district, uh, ex um, expanded um, Medicaid, um, which is, again, the program for low-income Americans, um, there is um, much broader access to insurance coverage for low-income populations. So this is, we describe in health policy that the sort of Medicaid expansion is carrying the lion's share of the impact for individuals with mental illness when you think about the Affordable Care Act as a whole in the states that have expanded. Um, also, the establishment of the new individual um, and small uh, group marketplaces within all 50 states provide subsidies to um, lower income individuals, many of which have um, diagnosable mental health conditions um, and aren't part of traditional employer-based insurance. So this creates another route to accessing care. Um, it, um, as we heard from the prior slide, expands um, uh, coverage for young adults up to age 25 so they can get coverage through their parents' policy. This is imp particularly important given what we know about age of onset of many of these conditions. Um, and the ACA includes um, a, a whole um, set of different um, delivery system and payment reforms um, that hold promise for changing the financing model in a way that incentivizes um, both better integration, treating people sort of in, in a whole body sense, mind and body, um, in a more comprehensive, integrated way, as well as um, strong financial incentives for pushing evidence-based care um, and a lot of workforce incentives as well. Why? Um, are efforts to broaden access to insurance coverage under, under the ACA important um, for individuals with mental illness? Let me just sort of illustrate this very quickly with this pre-ACA slide where you can see a much larger proportion of those with um, serious mental illness and other mental health disorders were uninsured prior to the ACA compared to the population without mental health disorders. And you see in particular those with severe mental illness were much less likely than those without mental health disorders to have had access to um, private insurance. To end, clearly there's a lot more that I could say about those topics, but I, I want to end um, 
my presentation by um, just saying a word or two about um, societal attitudes. And the data, uh, these data that I'm going to present here are from a study that we published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013. As you can see, nearly half of the American public view people with mental illness as uh, more dangerous than the general public. Only 29% of the public would be willing to work closely on a job with a person with a severe mental illness. And only 33% expressed a willingness to have a person with a serious mental illness as a neighbor. So you can see these high levels of perceived dangerousness and desire for social distance have persisted um, over the years. And these attitudes are actually quite striking um, when put alongside what's been a, a really significant shift in public attitudes toward less severe uh, um, disorders, a higher level of comfort that there's certainly a cohort effect to it, but a higher level of comfort um, among the public with sharing that someone's on an antidepressant or sharing that they've seen a counselor to deal with some life issue. Um, yet we see these persistently high negative attitudes increasing even in some cases toward the more severely ill. So what explains um, the persistence of these negative attitudes toward people with se severe mental illness? Um, it's hard to know exactly, but changes in media portrayals um, uh, and uh, the sort of nature of media coverage um, and the changing sort of demographics of how we as a society interact um, and view people with mental illness, I think probably have something to do with it. Um, we saw the slide um, related to um, rates of homelessness among the mentally ill, rates of incarceration among the mentally ill. Um, and these um, media portrayals can in turn influence the design of public policy, including um, the passage of laws like the one in New York focused on gun control measures, um, specifically with regard to individuals with mental illness, even in the context of data showing that mental illness explains very little of societal violence. Um, and we conducted an experiment that um, we um, published in the American Journal of Psychiatry in which we randomized a nationally representative group of adults to read a story of a mass shooting or to be randomized to a control arm. Um, those viewing the mass shooting story were unsurprisingly much more likely to rate people with severe mental illness um, as dangerous um, and much more likely about 14 percentage points. Um, and I want to end, um, I think, with a quote from Steve Sharfstein, who's run Shepherd Pratt um, Health System, um, which is right down the road from my office at Hopkins. Um, and he's run this health system for uh, almost 30 years now. Uh, he says, will we ever see an end to the stigma that's associated with mental illness? No, not as long as there are untreated, delusional, disheveled, threatening, homeless individuals on our streets and in high profile media examples of violence. Thank you. Okay, so Thank you very much. Uh, we, we are now uh, obviously inviting the three to join me up sta on stage. And this is the way that we're going to work for the rest of the, the evening uh, before the reception. I'm going to ask one question of all three, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. So while they're answering my question, perhaps some of you with questions can move to the microphones on either side of the room to be prepared to ask your questions. Uh, we would like to uh, know who you are and your affiliation, if you're willing to share that with us. And we would like you to add a, ask a succinct question. We don't need another speaker uh, to, to add to our uh, time frame. Uh, what we need is short, succinct questions that they will be able to respond to, hopefully, in the same manner, and be able to answer many of those questions that arise. So uh, my first question, do you have the mics? You're all ready to go? They're all on? Excellent. Uh, so I have a hypothetical for you, at least my question is hypothetical. Your answer, I hope, will be real. Um, let's assume that the Dana Foundation called you up and said, money is no object. Again, it's hypothetical. Uh, money is no object. Uh, what would you propose? Uh, what would be the most important thing related to the kinds of comments each of you made here today, tonight, as a research project? Uh, 
What would you want funded more than anything else? Money is not an object in terms of a research uh, project. Dr. Freimer, can we start with you and then just move down the road? Well, you know, I think that the answer is, is everything. <laughs> um, and particularly if money is no object. One of the things that I've increasingly come to believe is that no piece of this in isolation can really make sufficient progress. I mentioned that you know, I'm now involved in, in this thing called the Grand Challenge in Depression. And the reason I became involved in that is because it became clear to me that I could, my colleagues could find the causes of mental illness ultimately, hopefully, through genetic studies and other approaches. But that really wouldn't do very much for all the people that are suffering if, at the same time, there weren't um, uh, efforts you know, in, in the areas that the other speakers talked about to improve the access to treatment, to decrease stigma, to get people to have a different view of mental illness. Um, all of these things, I think, really have to be done together. So, so really, I really believe that, that in comparison with other areas of, of medicine and, and biomedical science, Mental illness has suffered from a fracturing and a disconnection of all these different components. And one of the things that we could do with resources is really bring all the strands together in a way that, that they never have been before. Thank you. Dr. Albano? Well, what you said, and <laughs> I would ha that's what I would do is, um, in a way, the Affordable Care Act, I think, is trying to have um, practice teams that are multidisciplinary in primary care settings, but I would want to move those teams into the school setting. Okay. Again, uh, money is no object. Dr. Barry, what would you propose? And while she's answering again, if you'd like to go to the mics uh, and be prepared to ask your questions, please do so. Please, go ahead. Yeah, so I think it's critical to have a robust research um, uh, um, agenda related to understanding whether these policies that we're designing are achieving the ultimate goal, which is to close the treatment gap. This, all of our, our presentations have touched on this enormous treatment gap and quality gap, quality of care gap. Um, and so, um, for example, it's not enough to just give somebody an insurance card. Does it make a difference in their receipt of care and their receipt of high quality care? It's not enough to create financial incentives for different types of providers to work together better. Is it making a difference in um, the kinds of care that people with mental illness get. We know that individuals with uh, mental illness die m much earlier from preventable um, chronic medical conditions. Um, and so it, it, it's critical to uh, see whether these policy interventions, and we're in this incredibly interesting, innovative moment in our country's history with regard to policy change related to healthcare and mental health and addiction in particular, is it making a difference? Well, thank you all. I, I, I think uh, Dr. Gill from the Barbara uh, Dana Foundation, we, we have a good portfolio for Dana to consider mm -hmm. next year. Uh, okay, so as promised, let's start here and then we'll go back and forth. Name, affiliation, and your question, please, sir. Sure. Hi, my name is Dan McHale from George Mason University. My question is for Dr. Freimer and the other panelists. You mentioned the global disease burden for mental illness and the relative lack of uh, funding for mental illness research. Uh, some of us are part of a student group dedicated to trying to close that gap. I wondered if you had any advice for us and the general public on increasing support for researchers. Um, well, it's, it's very gratifying to hear that, that students are actually advocating for, for um, improvements in this area. Uh, you know, I think that it is largely going to be um, the vocal involvement of young people in particular saying how important this is that's going to change this. It's going to change when Congress and the other 
bodies that are responsible for appropriating funds for research are consistently told how important this is. Yeah, I, I also think that um, we need to do a better job of educating the public about the benefits of um, science-based practice. And um, uh, you know, words like evidence-based treatment, science, these are buzzwords now that draw a lot of you know, um, hot emotions on one side or the other of you know, pro or against these things. But the bottom line is that the evidence-based interventions save lives. And somehow we have to get the broader population to understand that while working on the issue of stigma and to, to lobby to put more funding and you know, allocate more funds that we have in the public um, trust towards mental health and mental illness. OK, well, over here, please. Uh, yes, uh, hi, Jonathan Drake from uh, AAAS. Uh, in the last presentation, there was a very fascinating uh, time series graph showing the changes in uh, treatment modalities, uh, you know, decline of inpatient, uh, dramatic rise in prescription drugs. And what I noticed was uh, that uh, the takeoff in prescription drug use occurred right around 1998, which rem seems to me to be about the time that I first saw television advertising for prescription drugs uh, all over the place, saturating the airwaves. And so that led me to an another question, which is, uh, to what extent, and is it even known, uh, to what extent these uh, changes in treatment modalities are driven by changes in public policy versus uh, changes in individuals' preferences for how they choose to be treated versus the imperatives of the healthcare industry? Dr. Barry, do you want to? I might turn to my colleagues to, to talk about this too, but um, certainly there has been uh, a big increase in direct-to-consumer advertising. There has been a, 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 a large reliance in um, the m mental health field on um, uh, detailing and free samples. Um, and I think it's sort of the, this part of the marketplace, right? Um, and so I think the um, key issue that, one key issue that we worry about is conflict of interest. Um, and uh, the, um, in part, uh, motivated by uh, uh, our students, um, the push in recent years has uh, been for uh, medical schools, for residency programs, to put very strict conflict of interest policies in place um, to make sure that that um, influence um, is um, not impairing um, prescribers and students' um, sense of sort of where the evidence is and prescribing and making treatment decisions based on evidence um, and making sure that we have an environment that's free of conflict of interest to the greatest extent possible. Any of the other panelists want to quickly respond? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are a couple of, of things I'd just say in addition to that. I mean, in relationship to the point about um, about advertising, I think in part it, it, it relates to the fact, if you look at the first generation of drugs that were used against mental illness, they were almost all discovered by accident and not by pharmaceutical companies. For example, lithium, which was the drug that made in some way the biggest difference um, for, um, for mood disorders, was discovered uh, entirely by accident by, by practitioner in Australia. Um, similarly, first antipsychotics were discovered by accident as anesthetic agents and so forth. So in part, I think it reflects the fact that, that the pharmaceutical industry in the 70s and 80s was actually for the first time really engaged in developing drugs for psychiatry. So I think in the 90s is when you saw the effect of that. And then the other point which was also made in, in one of the talks is that one of the trends in these medications was from, from agents that really needed to be used by specialists to agents which were much safer and could be used by prim primary care doctors, with the SSRI antidepressants being the best example of that. They essentially um, were, became ubiquitous throughout the healthcare system in the US and around the world. Thank you. Could I just add one more point that might not be a popular point, but um, especially what I see in uh, families, families who are burdened in many ways, both parents are working, um, there's a lot of stress. 
medications are often easier because whether you're with your child taking them to therapy or you yourself are struggling, um, therapy is work. It's a, it's a lot of hard work. And so sometimes I think, you know, that's, that's there. And I think that, you know, the primary provi uh, providers of medication are typically primary care docs and such these days. And they're not doing mental health assessments. They're not, do they don't have the time to spend to learn about the patient and then refer um, to a therapist. They're responding to what they're hearing in terms of somatic complaints and stress and stuff, sleep issues. It's, it's a lot easier for the patient, so they're going for it. So again, I think education of the public is, is so important. Good, okay, please over there. <clears throat> yes, I'm Deborah Runkel, AAAS. What is the current status of the um, arguments, the, the controversy over prescribing Prozac to teenagers? The, do you want to take this? You're the psychiatrist on the panel. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, so I mean, I think that the, so the, the question relates to the controversy of prescribing. I think it's not just Prozac, but really the entire class of antidepressant drugs to teenagers. Um, this relates to some evidence that suggests that in contrast to, to adults who get these medications, the teenagers may be more likely to be sort of, um, uh, sort of become prone to violence to themselves or others as a result of these, um, this treatment. I think it's, to be honest, totally unclear whether that's so or not. It, these are so complicated, the, these relationships. You know, whether it's that they really are doing something specific that has this negative effect, or whether it's a result of actually people beginning to show a response, and whereas before they were sort of apathetic and unable to leave their room, and now suddenly they're able to get out and do something. I, I think that remains unclear. Uh, what I'd like to do now, since we're at 7 o'clock, what I'd like to uh, honor the, the, those who are up to ask questions, if you would go ahead, starting here, then back to there, and then back to there, to please ask your questions serially, and then we'll ask the panelists to respond to them. Good evening. My name is Samantha Dawson. and I recently graduated from Georgetown University. My question relates to the decrease in inpatient treatment. Um, not only are there enough beds currently, but there's also been a decrease in CBT for offered to inpatients. Um, Evidence-based treatments have proven that combination treatment is the most effective in most cases. And I wonder whether you have any, anyone on the panel has any suggestions on how we can address this issue, either policy-wise, um, to ensure that people gain access to the care they need, especially when in crisis and in patient treatment. Okay, so please remember that question. Think about your response over there. Hi, my name is Ling Wong. I'm a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. My question is for Dr. Albano. Um, I was surprised to see how low the treatment prevalence numbers you showed were. Um, in contrast, some would argue that the diagnosis rates for some mental health disorders can be too high. So for example, some people say that all these kids nowadays don't have ADHD, it's that our idea of what is normal is what's shifting. So how do we reconcile those differences in perspectives? Thank you. Thank you, and our final question. Yes, Jessica Wyndham from AAAS. I have two quick questions. My first for Dr. Barry, um, and that relates to what you mentioned at the end about stigma. I was thinking in particular about the Lufthansa tragedy in Europe. What do you consider to be the role and or the responsibility of the scientific community with regard to educating the media about how they portray mental illness and people with mental illness in the context of such tragedies? And for our other two presenters, uh, we know about research that's occurring as far as um, genetic heredity of depression, but I was wondering the extent to which uh, there's research going on about the environmental heredity for children growing up in families in which one or more family members have depression. Okay, I thought very good series of questions. Uh, Dr. Barry, do you want to start? Yeah. On, on, on any, you don't have, no I, one person has to answer all three. Okay. I'm, I'm going to just quickly respond to the, the two, two that I think pertain to um, my presentation and then I'll turn it over to the experts here. Um, First, on um, inpatient treatment, decline in inpatient treatment. You know, our standard under 
Olmstead is that we provide treatment in the least restrictive environment. And so I think part of the decrease in inpatient treatment has been connected to the civil rights uh, movement um, that has touched um, the mental health field, and that is to um, provide individuals with the most appropriate treatment in the least restrictive environment, and that led to the community mental health movement, which of course was terribly underfunded. Um, but I think that um, the most folks will agree that the answer is not to drive up inpatient treatment rates, um, but rather to make sure that we have the right services for, for, the, um, for people at the right stage they are um, in um, their treatment needs. And in particular, we have a, a huge um, problem with crisis intervention. Um, and there are some really innovative programs out there. New York has a great one um, to try to um, get people out of this sort of waiting pattern in emergency rooms and get them into real crisis intervention services. And for some individuals, some period of inpatient care is gonna be a, appropriate and for longer than is currently available. Uh, but I think there's value in this idea of least restrictive treatment environment um, that we need to build an effective community-based um, uh, treatment system around. Um, with regard to the point about um, the media and the obligation of the media. Um, the Carter Center has a, a wonderful program that I, I want everybody to know about that's related to journalism and mental illness. And they've had many cohorts of journalists that have come and been part of this effort to try to um, uh, provide journalists with information both related to the nature of these diagnoses but the impact of stigma um, on um, public support for policy, individuals' willingness to seek treatment, and to um, do their jobs in, as journalists in a way that doesn't um, further drive up stigma. So this is, I think, a really important program. And one last thing I'll say about news media and messaging. I think it's clear that we need stigma-reducing messages. And there's a science here, um, and we do um, experiments uh, in the lab to try to understand how to communicate with the public better about mental illness. And one thing, <coughs> we've learned a lot of important um, information related to changing the way we communicate. And one is that if you can show individuals um, through the media or through other types of communication, stories of recovery, stories of successful treatment, people that ha are successful in treatment, those um, stories can change public attitudes. And I think the disservice that we do is only showing through the news media um, these stories of people in distress, stories of people who are homeless, stories of people that have done terrible th things, and we haven't um, been aggressive about showing the stories of treatment that works. Thank you. Dr. Albano, which questions? I'll take the question on um, why is there such a low rate of treatment in the community, whereas the rates of uh, the prevalence of these disorders are so high. Some more recent analyses actually are showing of among kids who are being treated, um, part of the good news is that there's been an increase recently in children with more serious mental illnesses or serious um, impairment in functioning are getting care. Not enough, but that has risen some. The question about, uh, on the other hand, is there are children who are being treated that aren't necessary, they're more mildly impaired, um, and why uh, do they then, you know, have and make use of treatment uh, that uh, they probably or they might not need, we're not sure. And this may be that some categorization for those kids are around learning disabilities um, or milder ADHD and such. But at least there's been a shift that we know of the more um, impaired kids getting better access to care. So that's good news. So we may be seeing a little bit of shift in terms of treatment. But again, what we need to do is equip the workforce to deliver effective treatments. And it is through effective treatments that we may engage more people, more kids to stay in care when they need it. Thank you. Dr. Ryan. Primer? OK, so I'm just going to take uh, one minute to, um, we, you know, we've, the three of us have agreed on about 99% of everything that we've discussed, but I just wanted to d 
take issue with one comment, which is um, I, I actually disagree on the point about hospitalization, which is I think that it, as a result of trying to make less restrictive care, we've ended up making more restrictive care because of the fact that treatment has gone from the hospital to the criminal justice system. Yeah. And, um, and so I, anyway, I just want to make that point. But, but I'll answer also the point about genetics and the environment. And really what I believe is that the main end result of genetics is not going to actually be the identification of the molecules. It's that it's really going to allow us to study the environment in a much more rigorous way than we've ever been able to before. And we've seen this throughout all other areas of medicine. As we've begun to understand genetics, we can really focus in on what are this, the really the relevant environmental exposures for disease in a way that we were never able to before. And you know, the environment is a huge space that you know, encompasses everything in our lives. And we're never going to be able to understand it if we try to understand our entire environment. So my view is that what genetics is going to do is it's going to allow us to focus on, on really um, the, what are the most specifically important aspects of the environment in contributing to these diseases. Well, thank you all. And please join me in thanking our speakers.